Chapter One, Part Two of the Boy Scout Aviators by George Durston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kangaroo. Serious News, Part Two. It had been hard for Harry when his father's business called him to England to give up all the friendships and associations of his boyhood. It had been hard for him to leave school, to tear up by the roots all the things that bound him to his home. But as a scout he had learned to be loyal and obedient. His parents had talked things over with him very frankly. They had understood just how hard it would be for him to go with them. But his father had made him see how necessary it was. I want you to be near your mother and myself just now, especially here, he had said. I want you to grow up where I can see you. And moreover, it won't hurt you a bit to know something about other countries. You'll have a new idea of America when you've seen other lands, and I believe you'll be a better American for it. You'll learn that other countries have their virtues, and that we can learn some things from them. But I believe you'll learn, too, to love America better than ever. When we go home, you'll be broader and better for your experience. And Harry was finding out that his father had been right. At first he had had to put up with a good deal. He found that the English boys he met in school felt themselves a little superior. They didn't look down on him exactly, but they were, perhaps, the least bit sorry for him because he was not an Englishman. Always a real misfortune in their sight. He had resented that at first, but his Boy Scout training stood him in good stead. He kept his temper, and it was not long before he began to make friends. He excelled at games, even the English games that were new and strange to him, presented few difficulties to him. As he had explained to Dick, cricket was easy for any boy who could play baseball fairly well, and it was the same way with football. After the far more strenuous American game, he shone at the milder English football, the rugby game, which is the direct ancestor of the sport in America. All these things helped to make Harry popular. He was now nearly sixteen, tall and strong for his age, thanks to the outdoor life he had always lived. An only son, he and his father had always been good friends. Without being in any way a mollycoddle, still he had been kept safe from a good many of the temptations that beset some boys by their constant association with his father. It was no wonder, therefore, that John Grinfell, as soon as he had talked with Harry and learned of the credentials he bore from his home troop, had welcomed him enthusiastically as a recruit to his own troop. It had been necessary to modify certain rules. Harry, of course, could not subscribe to the quite the same scout oath that bound his English fellows. But he had taken his scout oath as a tenderfoot at home, and Grenfell had no doubts about him. He was the sort of boy the organization wanted, whether in England or America, and that was good enough for Grenfell. Though the boys, as they walked toward their houses, did not quite realize it, they were living in days that were big with fate. Far away, in the chancelleries of Europe, and not so far away, in the big government buildings in the west end of London, the statesmen were even then making their best effort to avert war. No one in England, perhaps, really believed that war was coming. There had been war scares before. But the peace of Europe had been preserved for forty years or more, through one crisis after another. And so it was a sunny surprise, even to Grenfell, when as they were came into Putney High Street, just before they reached Putney Bridge, they met a swam of moose boys, excitedly streaking extras. Germany threatens Russia, they yelled. War, sure. Mr. Grenfell bought a paper, and the scouts gathered around him while he read the news that was contained on the front page, still damp from the press. I'm afraid it's true, he said soberly. The German emperor has threatened to go to war with Russia. 
unless the Tsar stops mobilizing his troops at once. We shall know tonight, but I think it means war. God save England, may he still keep out of it. For that night a meeting at Mr. Grenfell's home in West Kensington had long been planned. He lived not far from the street in which both Harry and Dick lived, and as the party broke up on the other side of Putney Bridge, Dick, voicing the general feeling, asked the question, Are we to come tonight, sir, with the news? Yes, yes indeed, said the scoutmaster. If war is to come, there is all the more reason for us to be together. England may need us all yet. Dick had asked the question because, like all the others, he felt something was in the air. He was sobered by the news, although, like the rest, he did not yet fully understand it. But they all felt that there had been a change. As they looked about at the familiar sight about them, they wondered if, a year from then, everything would still be the same. War! What did it mean to them? To England? I wonder if my father will go to war, Dick broke out suddenly, as he and Harry walked along. I hadn't thought of that, said Harry, startled. Oh, Dick, I'm sorry. Still, I suppose he'll go if his country needs him. End of chapter one. Part two. Recording by Kangaroo.